I'm a Marine. I got a son who's a Marine. And if there was a time ever that we sent our sons and daughters to fight overseas to protect our oil supply, we, we don't have to do it anymore because of Donald Trump. And of course, the private sector was going crazy on fracking, developing, and we were, we were just climbing our energy resources on state and on private property, but not in the American West. And Trump came in, he said, let's start drilling here in the West. Let's drill in New Mexico. Let's drill in Wyoming. Let's drill in Utah. Let, you know, if we, you know, let's leave it up to the private sector to find the energy. And we became energy dependent shortly after I got I mean, you, to you Washington. You remember when we were kids. Yeah. It's been a little too long since we've had a chat with Perry Penley because, you know, he's big and important now. But I remember when he was just that guy from Mountain State's Legal Foundation that everybody seemed to have a problem with. Welcome back. Great to be home. Yeah, right. great to be back in the West. So for those who don't know, right. you were the acting acting BLM uh, director, which is great because I didn't even know you were into Black Lives Matter. <laughs> and that the lead role you took was, was, was impressive. So you were the acting head of the Bureau of Land Management for Donald Trump. I thought it was an inspired choice Thank because you. of all the work you've done right. over the centuries yeah. <laughs> uh, for, for, for public lands. Right. Uh, and um, I got so many questions for you. So let's start off with this one. You have always loved public lands. Uh, you've oh, yeah, always you bet. loved, you know, and, and because you believe in property rights, right. the common thought is he likes property rights. Yeah. He must hate the environment. And it's, it's so opposite. Oh, it's explain, totally. Explain, explain yeah, well, that. It's for, totally for, opposite. For somebody who doesn't understand, how can you be in favor of people being right. able to use the land they want to, how they want to use it, and still be good to our land? Right. Well, we've talked about this before, John, and the bottom line is uh, people who own something, they care for it. They take care of it. Uh, nobody's a bigger environmentalist than the ranchers out here in, in Colorado and Wyoming. They're taking care of lands because it was passed on to them by their homesteading families, and they're going to pass it on to their kids, God willing. So uh, nobody takes better care. But uh, the reality is that a third of the country is owned by the United States government. Uh, that was set in stone decades ago. There are laws governing how it's uh, managed. And I've recreated on, I've hiked on them, I've fished on them, I've gone camping. Uh, I've used the public lands. I love the public lands. Uh, I think the government ought to obey the law. And so I fought for people that got hurt by the federal government. So when I went in to take over the BLM, all the environmentals, the greenies, uh, all these NGOs, they, their heads all exploded. And they said, oh, Penley hates public lands. Well, Nothing could be further from the truth. It reminded me of um, when my friend, your friend too, uh, Gail Norton, became right. uh, the head of right. the Department of Interior under George W. And they went after her sure. as you know. Oh my God, she yeah. you know because she believes in the law. Right. Um, Robert Redford did some sort of anti Gail Norton thing, oh, yeah. and she invited him to release the condors, and he wouldn't do it. And but. We both know her. She loves the land. Oh, she yeah, hikes yeah. the land, just like you. And it just it. What's weird is um, watching it from the sidelines. Yeah. You know the attacks on you while you were running right. the BLM. It's like it is so ridiculous for anybody who knows you. Well, and, and for, it was from the usual suspects too. Tell uh, me who are the usual suspects? Well, they're the radical environmental groups, these multi-million dollar organizations that have an agenda, and their agenda is to close up the land. Uh, they, they really don't want people on the land. And it was great working for President Trump because, you know, you'd think, guy from Queens gets the West. Well, he really did. Uh, well, and, and, and he wanted to open the lands to several things, one of which was recreation. You know, we, the president got passed and signed the Great American Outdoors Act. Five presidents tried to get that done. Nine secretaries of the interior tried to get that done. Donald Trump got it done. I was there when he signed it. Wow. And what that did was put a huge cash and fusion into taking care of the lands because for decades and decades, uh, the Park Service, for example, BLM, for example, has not taken care of structures, uh, the places people go visit, the places where our firefighters fight out of when the fires and come. also just access yeah, so, exactly. So, uh, mind you, it's been years because once you have kids, you're not allowed to ha have any fun <laughs> and do something for yourself. But BC, before children, I used to go out shooting. Sure. 
and I would go on to forest land, and you could you could go shooting out there as long as you did it safely, and the right. rules were very strict. And you you found some usually logging roads uh, that you could get back in, but it it's we've got all this great public land exactly. for the public. And unless you have a helicopter, it's really hard to get into these lands. Right. So, um, well, that's the thing we did, John. We we opened up the lands. We increased access. We made some land acquisitions that allow more people to come in. And during the pandemic, when the pandemic hit during the summer, and everybody was getting cabin fever because they couldn't get out, I made the decision. Uh, thanks to the president at the BLM, we're going to open up the lands. We are going to stay open 100%. And although about 83% of us were doing uh, teleworking, uh, if we had our lands open, I went on Tucker Carlson's show and talked about it, got a wonderful tweet from the president congratulating me for being out there. But uh, we kept the lands open. Uh, look at what they're doing now under Joe Biden. They're closing everything down. They're, you know, they're, they're scaredy cat. They're double masking. Let me, let me ask you just, just for clarification. Sure. People get mixed up between the Bureau of Land Management, yes. which owns a bunch of land. I don't know if owns the right, cares for a bunch of land. Yes. The Forest Service, which owns a bunch of land. Yes. And then National Parks, which own a lot of land, but not as much as the other two. Sure. What, what is the difference between those? And who, who takes care of all this third of the country that well, you're, individuals you're, you're right. It's it's divided up, and you go to a place like Nevada, you're going to have the Department of Defense running a bunch of property, as right. it does here in Colorado. But the bottom line is, Bureau of Land Management has 245 million acres of surface that it manages, uh, primarily in the American West and Alaska. Uh, the U.S. Forest Service has about 190 uh, million acres, but at the same time, the Bureau of Land Management is responsible for about 700 million acres of subsurface for oil and gas and mining activities. And so we manage all that. And the Park Service, uh, I don't know what their numbers are. I think they're around 90 million. Uh, but the park's attitude is sort of, you know, you, you go to the parks and you visit the park under the park's own term. Right. But uh, the BLM is totally different. We're a, really a working landscape. You might have oil wells there. You might have ranching, uh, uh, cattle grazing. You'll have, have mining. Ge geothermal. Yep. You'll have mining. You'll have water projects. You'll have recreation. You'll have bike paths. You have wilderness areas, national monuments. We've got it all, and it's all accessible to the public. Let's talk about the choice to get the BLM right. into Grand Junction. Um, this is a really controversial uh, decision. Um, only in Washington, D.C. Only in Washington, <laughs> D.C. Well, there are some, and I understand this, the concern of, well, what happens when you start bringing the bureaucrats out to Colorado? Right. We're going to get more bureaucrats, and it's just going to make the state even worse than it is. But, <laughs> but the idea of putting, yeah. putting the control, the headquarters of the land yeah. in the land. Exactly. Um, we, if I've seen maps, you know, dividing yep. the country down the middle, and on the eastern half, yes. there's almost no government-owned, uh, not all, uh, all, but about but, oh, east of the Mississippi, about fifty thousand acres owned by the Bureau of Land Management. Fifty fifty thousand acres. acres out of two hundred forty-five million. So nothing. Uh, yeah. So ninety-nine point nine nine percent of the land that BLM manages is here in the West or in Alaska. Who made the call? I understand that. Trump made the final call, but who, who was really pushing the president to do it? Well, I mean, it goes back. Uh, we, uh, I, was, uh, I happened to be uh, at, at a meeting, met uh, former mayor of Grand Junction. She said, we've been pushing that for, for, yeah. for forever. And I, I, I know the uh, congressman from the Western Slope had been pushing it uh, for a long, long time. Uh, the bottom line, it's been suggested for a long time. Zinke first proposed it. Uh, Bernhardt took over. Uh, David Bernhardt from Rifle took over. Uh, As the Department of Interior India, Secretary. Took over the Secretary of the Interior. And, I'll and tell he you, was, he's your, was your boss. He's my boss. He's my direct boss. He's the guy who called me up and right. said, Perry, come to Washington, uh, take over to the BLM. And so uh, <laughs> when I met with him on the, on the 3rd of July for my uh, coming aboard interview, uh, when can you start thing? And he had a spreadsheet laid out on all these people who are moving. And he said, Perry, this is your deal now. And so I, I embraced it because 99.99% of the land is out here, 97% of the employees out here, 10,000 employees, 97% of them out here, and all the smarty pants 
all the big shots, the and all the lobbyists, all the senior officials were in Washington, all the decision makers. And you say, how can you have the decision makers in Washington? So, so we have a wild horse problem. We have 95,000 wild horses and burrows on the public land. We got to do something about it. They're mostly in the state of Nevada. And all the people who are making, running the program are in Washington, D.C. And you say, what sense does that make? And so we brought all those people out to Colorado. So the headquarters is instead of Washington, over by the national uh, uh, baseball team, uh, the Washington Nationals, uh, over by their stadium. We brought them out to Grand Junction, and then we put experts where their expertise was needed. So wild horse people are in Nevada, recreation people are in Utah, oil and gas people are in New Mexico, our archaeologists are in Santa Fe. Um, it's a no-brainer to have these so, experts where they belong. What do you think the odds are that the Biden administration is going to recall them and put them back uh, in, in the beltway? I think it has a problem. I mean, you, you, this new secretary, the Secretary of Interior, Deb Haaland, uh, I mean, we put, she's big on Indian issues, and I get it, I uh, want it good for her, but we put 35 archaeologists in Santa Fe. What do they do? Primarily take care of Indian artifacts. And you want to send those people back to Washington? Seriously? They're in Santa Fe right now, right here, doing the, the important work. Uh, I also think that uh, it's going to be a huge cost uh, to move them back. Uh, and it, you're going to have a lot of people quit. And I'll tell you why. Everybody we hired, and we hired the best people we could possibly find, and we found great expertise out here. Because not only did these people, they were petroleum engineers, they were mining engineers, they were recreation types, they were archaeologists, you name it, they were experts but in their field. they don't want to live in no, the Beltway. No, they don't. They, they in God's country. Well, everybody I knew in Washington, D.C., I, I had an apartment across the street, so I was cool, but everybody I met and worked with in Washington had an hour and a half to two hour commute one way. Every day. And, and, and over there in Grand Junction, it's 10 minutes. Talk to me about the president, Trump. Um, so right. you, you worked for him. The intermediary was your boss, the Secretary right. of Interior. Um, you know, here's a guy from New York City. Yes. Uh, he obviously doesn't get the West. He doesn't get <laughs> resources. He doesn't understand what it's like to be out in Colorado. He's some Manhattanite who uh, speaks funny. What was your impression of what? the president? Everyone, every, everything you just said is wrong. He gets the West. He is for the little guy. He is for the little guy. One of the most important things he did when he first came in, and Biden's about to screw it up, uh, and I'm not talking about the border. I'm talking about energy. I'm a Marine. I got a son who's a Marine. And if there was a time ever that we sent our sons and daughters to fight overseas to protect our oil supply, we, we don't have to do it anymore because of Donald Trump. And, of course... The private sector was going crazy on fracking, developing, and we were, we were just climbing our energy resources on state and on private property, but not in the American West. And Trump came in, he said, let's start drilling here in the West. Let's drill in New Mexico. Let's drill in Wyoming. Let's drill in Utah. Let, you know, if we, you know, let's leave it up to the private sector to find the energy. And we became energy dependent shortly after I got I mean, you, to you Washington. You remember when we were kids? Yeah. The idea of being energy independent. Oh yeah. Not relying on the Saudis. Not relying on the Middle East. It was science fiction. It was. It could not happen exactly. in our lifetimes. It would never happen. Never Maybe happened. nuclear would help us do electricity, but that's not going to power airplanes. Um, well, and, I, and I, I went to a lecture back in the 90s, and the guy talked about, and there were 2,000 people in the room, smart lawyers in the room, and this guy talks about peak oil, and he says, we're right here, <laughs> peak, peak oil. oil, and we'll never <laughs> have any more than we have, and from now on, it's, you know, kiss ourselves goodbye Everything. because it's over, and, and you know, uh, Katie barred the door on how much we can discover, and it's, it's not because the federal government did anything, it's because we unlocked the creativity of the American people, and they said, we can find energy. We can find energy in America. And we don't have to go to war. You know what, what's so fascinating um, is that the, the left that hates Trump so much will never give him credit for not getting us entangled oh, into military action overseas, absolutely. which is something they hated George W. Bush for, and they were quiet, but they hated Obama for, for yeah. continuing it. Yeah. Uh, so. Exactly. And, and, and he really understood the West. And, and, and I'll tell you something else he did that's so important. You know, it's, it's March as we talk. You know, we're coming up on April. We've got snow in the air. Uh, but fire season's on its way. 
we're all have already having fires. There's a fire up uh, up in Gillette the other day. Some little kid went out and lit, a, uh, lit up a fire. Eighty percent of our fires are caused by humans. And President Trump was the only president in my lifetime who understand, understood wildfires in the West. He went out to the governor, Governor Newsom in California. He sat down with him. He said, you got to cut your trees, governor. you got to reduce the fuel loads. And that was the mandate we had from the president from day one. Get rid of the fuel loads. And here in the, in the Mountain West, what we have is not so much the trees, although we do have the forest. And you look at I-70, oh, my God. But uh, you got grasslands. And you got uh, uh, north of Grand Junction, we, we had that Pine Gulch fire, yep. which was a terrible terror. For a while, it was the biggest fire in Colorado history. It was pinion juniper. Pinion juniper is an invasive species. And we got to get rid of that. We got to return the sagebrush. And uh, so that's what the president wanted us to do. Imagine that, a guy from Queens who understands Western wildfires. Well, and the Forest Service has been so terrible yes. about managing the lands and cleaning yes. the forests and caring for them. Right. You know, going back to your point, if somebody owns that property, right. uh, they tend it a whole lot better because they don't want their trees burning up. They don't want to lose everything they have. Well, you look at the way the tribes manage, for example, down in Arizona. We had uh, several years ago a uh, huge wildfire in, in Arizona. They thought it would never stop. It went to the tribal boundary and it stopped. Why? Because the tribe was ha harvesting the timber. You know, and you know they talk about climate. And just to be clear, sure. When you harvest the timber, yes, you don't leave an asphalt pavement behind. <laughs> Uh, you actually, when you harvest, you replant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you replant and you already have growing trees in there. Yeah, I mean, it's not a clear cut. Right. Uh, you go in, you leave some trees. Uh, but the thing is, uh, when you have these overgrown forests like we have in so many places, drive up and down I-70 and look at all that pine keel yeah. uh, uh, that, we, that we got. Uh, I just I shudder to think about a fire going through there. But uh, what that does is it, more fires. You come in, it's going to burn it down, and the wildlife won't go in there. You, you want to find wildlife? You, you go, to a, go to a forest that's recently been harvested because then the wildlife come in. And the, uh, American Indians knew that from the beginning. They were always setting fires back in the early days because when the, when the settlers, when the, you know, the trappers came across, that's what they found. The um, new growth also gives out more oxygen and sucks sure. up more carbon dioxide, you know, um, which is just so weird to say, if you really <laughs> want to cut carbon, you know, plant, you know, cut the trees and, and get exactly, new growth. Exactly. But, all right, let's, let's get to the politics part of it, though. Um, I mean, you were, you were under attack on day one. And it, was, it was so, I, 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 I tortured myself and listened to NPR sometimes, and they, they, they hated you. It was just, it was so delicious. Um, <laughs> I enjoyed it so much. Um, what what is it that they did not get? I mean, if 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 they understood why Perry Penley is good for the Bureau of Land Management, they would have understood what. Well, they they would have understood that for thirty years, for three decades, I represented every kind of person who uses the public land. It might be a cattleman, it might be a sheepman, it might be a hunter, it might be a hiker, a concessionaire, uh, it might be an energy type. This is your job as a lawyer to defend. And you were with Mountain with Mountain States Legal right. Foundation, one of the premier uh, organizations to defend right and uh, represent property rights and, and, and in the environment and and, and 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 to ensure that the law is enforced the way Congress wrote it. You know, not the way some. Uh, left-wing environmental group says, "Well, uh, we know the law was written that way, but we don't like that." I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, the law says, the Mineral Leasing Act of 1920 says, the Bureau of Land Management will have a lease sale every quarter, four times a year. Cheyenne, for the state of Wyoming, will hold a lease sale so that people think, I know where there's oil. I know where there's gas and I can find it. And that's what Congress wanted. And what the Obama people did is said, we're not going to hold those lease sales. We don't like that. That's bad stuff. No, you don't get to decide that. You implement the laws. When Congress writes a law, you implement the law. And as a lawyer, I consider myself an officer of the court. And I'm duty-bound to enforce the law. You know, they think, oh, Penley's going to pick and choose. No, Penley doesn't get to pick and choose. Congress already decided that. So, you know, the president was, he wanted more recreation. He wanted to increase recreation. We increased it. He wanted to increase oil and gas. Yes, we did. Mining. Uh, Congress wanted renewable energy. We, we greenlit the biggest 
uh, solar project in the history of the country, the Gemini Project down in Las Vegas. I went up to a wind river, uh, wind projects we got up in the state of Wyoming, up in Medicine Bow. I'm a state of the art stuff. Uh, that's really remarkable because, con why? Because Congress said, do it. And so we did it. Um, so, you know, I, I approach these things, uh, you know, as a Marine number one, because the president says, do this, and, you know, I know how to salute. Uh, but also because, as I told uh, my congressman uh, from the 2nd District here in Colorado during a, during a hearing, uh, you write the laws and we salute and we obey the law and we enforce it. And so they never did get that. And so they would say, well, Penley said 20 years ago X. Well, 20 years ago I was representing somebody and we had a case against the government. Uh, but it that really, was it. It really was, you know, what's, what's amazing in, in the cancel culture is that it's not who you are, it's not what you do. Right. It's what did you say 30 years ago, you know, what can we get you on tape saying, you know, the whole Don Imus thing, we're going to catch him saying something he shouldn't yeah, say. Right. And as an attorney running Mountain States Legal Foundation, your job was to advocate for your clients. That's right. And when, um, and I don't see the left holding their own to the same standard, oh, no, no. which is, well, back when he was practicing law, he said this. Well, of course you said this. It was your job while That's you're right. defending your client. Yeah, and, and, and I'm not running away from any client. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not embarrassed. I have never been embarrassed by any client. Three, three decades, 30 years. I'm in most lawyers, that's... And I've argued at the Supreme Court of the United States. I was there three times on a case. So, you know, I've done it all as far as being a lawyer is concerned. And I'm not running away from my clients, but I'm just saying. And when I spoke to, she's now Secretary of the Interior, but uh, she was a congresswoman, uh, Deb Holland. I was in a hearing, and she asked me a question about a case I had and somebody I represented. And she said, well, is that, is that any way for the director of the BLM to talk? And I said, Congresswoman, I wasn't the director of the BLM at the time. I was an attorney representing this person. I would never say that as director of BLM because I have different responsibilities. Oh, she says, you know, as the light went on, she said, oh, that was then, this is now. I said, yes, ma'am, that was then, this is now. And the, and the, and the environment, and, and the reporters never got that. And here's, a, I'll give you a, one of my frustrations with the media was the, the greenies, uh, NGOs, the left-wing groups, they would say something about me. And a reporter would come to me and say, oh, Perry, what do you say about that? And I would answer that. And, and then some green group would repeat it, and the reporter would come back to me, right. and I would think, hey, dude, I answered that question. How about saying to that green person who told you that, how about saying, well, Penley's already answered that. What do you say in rebuttal? You know, but the dialogue never went to that. It never went, well, he said this, and, that, and go back and forth. How did, how did the rank and file of the BLM accept you running the place. Yeah. Now, you were acting uh, director. You can go through all the machinations of... of but you I, were I, I was never acting director. Oh, okay. I was I was a deputy director of policy and programs, and the, the, the term of art was exercising the authority of the director. So, you know, they say, oh, you violated the Vacancies Act. No, I didn't violate the Vacancies Act. So, uh, but I was running the place. You were running the place. I was running the place. Did you find... You know, the term being the deep state, which I believe is a it's real. real thing. It's real. It's a real thing. What, tell me about it. What do you mean? Well, I, 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 let me say first to answer your first question. And, and how the, I got 10,000 people working for me, right? And so my job, because I, I didn't want to be cloistered in, in, in Washington, D.C., or I didn't want to be isolated in Grand Junction when we moved the office out to Grand Junction. So I went into the field. And I went to the state office, I went to the district office, I went to the field office. I had all employee meetings. I had every person in that office would come in and, and we, we, we'd do a two hour Q&A, you know, you know with, with, and employees would tell me stuff, not secret stuff, but they'd tell me stuff. And I'd say, well, we ought to fix that. Uh, how do we fix that? And so we would fix it. And then, because I'm a writer, written five, published five books, um, I wanted to write about it. You know, I'd, well, wow, has anybody ever written about that? I'd be talking to some BLM employee. You know, the people in the field were the experts. They, they're the, what we call in Washington, the SMEs, the subject matter experts. And they SMEs, knew it. SMEs, I haven't SME, heard that SMEs. one. SMEs, and yeah, we had all these great terms. And uh, so here I get into the field and I'd meet the duty expert. I get, you know, when we have a data call, when somebody said, what's this? Or give us facts on this. There was a person in the field who knew that. 
And I met with those people, and I wanted to write about what they did because I found it so fascinating. So I published some almost uh, two dozen articles in the time uh, op-eds in the time that I was there for 18 months, uh, simply be because I wanted to lift them up and, and, and give them credit for what they were doing to help the American people say, hey, uh, our money's being well spent. So you use the term good marine, that you take orders from the president, exactly. goes through the, his department head, goes to you, yes. goes out, and you get it done. I get it All done. Right. Um, I have a feeling that during the Trump years, there was a whole lot of foot dragging down yes. through, through the machinery of government. Right. The term deep state, uh, I, I don't think I like that term because it, it sounds as if it was a coordinated conspiracy. I just think that the organic culture was we hate that guy, we hate what he's ordering us to do, so we're gonna take our own sweet time own and sweet try time. to throw, we're, we're gonna try to throw wrenches in the machinery as much as we can. I, am I, we am I were close to right? And give me, give me an example of that. And, and, and I agree with you. And uh, uh, Department of Interior, run by Secretary Bernhardt, 71,000 employees. Uh, BLM, 10,000 employees, run by me. And uh, I will tell you this, I can't speak for David Bernhardt and the Park Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service and everybody else. But I'll think, talk about the BLM. We got stuff done. We made stuff happen. You mentioned my friend Gail Norton. 20 years ago, uh, Gail was presented with an Inspector General report saying law enforcement in the Department of the Interior and, and the Bureau of Land Management is messed up because we have rangers reporting to people, civilians. And we need rangers to report to other law enforcement officers up the food chain. For 20 years that sat undone because the bureaucrats didn't want it done. And I went to David, uh, Secretary Bernhardt, and I said, uh, David, we got to get this done because it's the right thing to do for our rangers. It's the right thing for to do. We got 300 rangers and special agents uh, managing those two or trying to enforce the law on 245 million acres. And we owe it to them. And we owe it to the sheriffs that work with them out here to ensure professionalism, and we got that done. So that was a, a good... So my point is that uh, I was in charge of something, and I, made, I tried to make stuff happen. The stuff I couldn't control was where I saw the deep state, uh, the Office of Management and Budget. Well, we're trying... Every regulation we write has to go through the Office of Management and Budget, which is out of the White House. And my experience when I was with the Reagan administration was... Are these guys on the same team? Do these guys really work for Ronald Reagan? And, you know, fast forward to 2019, 2020, I'm in meetings with OMB, and I turned to these people from OMB. I'm, I said, I'm glad nothing's changed in the last 40 years. Because, honest to goodness, John, I wondered, are these guys, do, does the president know these people are doing what they're doing? Just dragging their feet. Uh, Another example, and, and, I, I, it, and it worked because yes, you know, it takes so long to untangle the regulatory yeah. world. It's not like he can say deregulate this and it goes. You have to have hearings and hearings and this and process and process. Adding the regulations yes. is a whole lot easier than pulling them out. Oh, and and and, and getting them fixed so they work, so they make sense. And uh, another, I think, another problem is the Department of Justice. Uh, the Department of Justice, you know, they have an expression in Washington that the people at Justice Department talk about just us. <laughs> just us. And, and I'm sorry, uh, that's the way it is. And these lawyers have a unique perspective, and, and their perspective is, you know, uh, Trump will come and go, Biden will come and go, Harris will yep. come and go, uh, but we'll always be here, and what's right, even, what even, works for us. Even when I was in a, at the RTD board, you know, this, you know, this is this is not the Department of Interior. You right. Know, this is just, and I remember uh, the support staff there saying, "Oh yeah, uh, if we were here before you, we'll be a law. We'll hear long oh, yeah. after you." You know, it's like, well, it was very clear. Let me, let me, yeah. You don't run the place. The, yeah, the and the lawyers do, and and the machinery and, uh, runs itself. And there were and there were things that should have been done that the lawyers should have argued in cases that should, they should have argued and they didn't argue. And you know, it frustrated. And, and as a lawyer. You know, my desire, you know, I'd say to Bernhardt, I'd say, David, I want to go, let me go over to Justice Department. Let me crack some skulls. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going to be a Marine and go over there. Uh, but as a lawyer, I sort of, as you know, I was running the Bureau of Land Management. I had to stick in my lane. All right, let's, let's finish it up on this. Sure. Well, Trump ain't the president anymore. Nope. And um, my guess is you're looking for a different job. 
<laughs> what, what are you going to be doing? I, I really don't know. You know, when I left, when I left the foundation, and I had a great run at the foundation. This is the Mountain States Legal Foundation. Uh, exactly. 30 years. It was really great. I mean, I took an... I took an organization that, you know, had one foot in the crapper and, and another foot on the banana peel, and it was about to go bankrupt. And I built it into an organization with $10 million in the bank and its own building and four trips to the Supreme Court and five published books uh, that we can talk about all of our clients. So it was a great run. And when I left, I thought it was time to go. And, yeah, I didn't know what. I was starting to write another book. And all of a sudden, I'm pumping gas up at King Supers, and David Bernhardt calls and, and invites me to Washington. So, I'm I'm looking at that. See, I knew you were uh, I knew you were anti environment. You're pumping gas I'm instead pumping of plugging gas. in your Tesla. <laughs> exactly, pumping gas. So I'm just uh, you know God's taking care of me all all this way, and you know I'm fearful for our country right now. Why so? I, I, what's that? Why so? Well, articulate uh, it real briefly. If you put it in, on a bumper sticker, you're fearful for. Fearful for the country because uh, uh, the leftists are in control and and and, and they don't get it. Uh, we just went to a meeting in Anchorage and had our heads handed to us by the Red Chinese. Uh, these guys are it's amateur hour at the White House. Joe Biden is really non copus mentis, and as far as I'm concerned, he's not really there. Uh, we have a bunch of leftists running things. They want to shut down fracking. Honest to crap. I mean, the first thing that happened when they did that was the Indian tribes out here in, in North Dakota, in Utah, in Colorado, in, uh, in New Mexico said, wait a second, you don't mean us, do you? And by say, oh, right, right, we don't mean you. But fracking's, a, you know, shut down fracking, send us off to war, make us energy dependent again. That's totally insane. And what, what's happening at the border? Oh, it, it's inhuman. It, it boggles the mind. And it's not... Uh, there was a sheriff up in uh, Massachusetts a couple of years ago, in 2014, when all this started under Obama. And uh, Trump put an end to it. But it started under Obama. And he said, we are all, the sheriff in Massachusetts, outside of Boston, says we are all border states now. And we are. They're flying, they're flying people from Mexico up to, I guess, North Dakota or Minnesota or somewhere uh, because there are too many of them coming across. And we put that, we put that wall up. Bureau of Land Management gave land to the really? U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. I went to the border, and we, we've got wilderness lands sitting on the border in California, a 17,000-acre 17, wilderness area that's supposed to be like man never was there. And thousands and thousands and thousands of Eagle Land immigrants are coming to the crew every day. And they get cold in the night, and they set fires, and the fires light off. They leave their trash. They leave their garbage. It's a wilderness area. It's supposed to be pristine. No, it ain't. And we put up a wall, and Biden won't, you know, wants to tear them down. It makes no sense. I'll, I'll answer my question this way, <laughs> which is uh, why we are in such danger is because the liberals of the past don't exist. They are the progressives of the current. There used to be, uh, pro there used to be liberals who cared about free speech. You used to care about right. due process. You used to care that uh, you are innocent until proven guilty. Exactly. And you might disagree with them on philosophies, but they were honorable people. And right now, the the left has turned from being uh, the party for the working class to the party of of socialized engineering uh, and, and collectivism at as fast a rate as possible. Uh, for them, you know, we, we, I was raised with the ends don't justify the means. Yeah. The, the folks who are pushing the left today, the ends are the only thing that counts. Well, and they're the corporate elite, they're the media elite, they're the, the, they're the Google and the, and, and the Facebook and the, you know, all that stuff and the Twitter. Uh, uh, they're the university elites. Uh, uh, they're the leftists from the They big, own the, the commanding cities. heights of culture. They and, own entertainment, and, you know, they own education, they own the media. My, my dad uh, had a fifth grade education. My mom had a fifth grade education. They were working people. And that, those are my roots. And uh, uh, that's really the party of Trump right now. Uh, those people, because he cared about those people. I care about those people. And Joe Biden clearly does not. I think we'll leave it there. <laughs> it's good to have you back in Colorado, my friend. Good to be back, sir. Thank you. Thank you for this time. My pleasure. If you enjoyed that conversation, by all means, 
click one of these other great programs. We have the best conversations with the most fascinating Coloradans. And subscribe to our channel. Just click down below and hit that little bell button too. You don't want to miss a single show.